All right, we're rolling. Welcome to this Zoom call. Uh, I am Tony Ross. I'm a member of the chamber music group Accordo, which is in Minnesota, made up of principal players from the Minnesota Orchestra and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Um, we are doing a virtual concert. And one of the pieces on our virtual concert is uh, called American Haiku. It's a duo for cello and viola by our guest on this Zoom call, Paul Wianco. Um, this uh, virtual concert is on March 11th, and we are, of course, uh, sponsored by the Schubert Club here. And we are always grateful to the Schubert Club for their sponsorship. So welcome, Paul. And uh, let's just have, uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, it sounds like you've almost always been a composer. It started quite early. I mean, what was your inspiration to start composing in the first place? Ah, uh, that's, uh... That's a, a very astute uh, observation. Uh, I started playing cello when I was five and uh, started kind of uh, also getting tired of practicing also when I was about five. So I would <laughs> kind of uh, improvise and fool around and you know get in trouble for not focusing. And um, so I sort of grew up with the mentality that you know improvising was not allowed um for many years um so i think i've been a kind of a suppressed uh improviser composer basically since i started playing cello and eventually it kind of bubbled over uh during high school when i started um, doing more arranging and then in college when i started doing more experimentation with my own music and working with uh, various uh bands and artists around town and uh, dipping a toe into to comp composition. Um, and then it kind of uh, all tied together more recently uh, in the last 10 years or so when I really kind of decided to give uh, composition uh, a shot. And um, that's, yeah, that's when I realized I'd been truly suppressing something uh, important to me. Um, and I've been yeah, composing and performing ever since. That's awesome. You know, I was I, I had heard your music uh, in the last five or six years on a few occasions, and I always was very interested in it. And it always had kind of really special qualities. And I I, I hadn't played any yet. Um, I bought your cello quartet. Um, but when Steve Copes, one of our leaders of the group, um, asked me if I'd play your duo, I was thrilled. I said, of course. Um, the only problem was for me, as I looked at a performance you did uh, with your partner, Ayane, um, there were some techniques in there that I said, no, 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 I better get the music to this early because I don't know if I can do this. Um, it turned out they weren't as hard as I thought, but it, it's a super compelling piece. Um, and that piece called American Haiku, um, does it have something to do with your background being having Japanese roots or is it just, um, what was the inspiration for that piece especially? Well, was there something uh, in, you know, that, that, that you could tell us? Yeah, absolutely. And, and and I can't wait to hear you do those techniques. And I'm glad to hear you say that it wasn't as challenging as it appeared, because that's as a performer, first composer, second, it, chronologically, at least. That's sort of my goal is to never make things unnecessarily technically challenging for the performer, because I want people to just enjoy themselves. And I want to be able to play my own music and enjoy myself. and. Uh, um, anyways, I can't wait to hear you hear you do it. Um, as in terms of the uh, inspiration behind the piece, let's see. I guess um, this was one of my earliest uh, real concert music commissions. Um, so I was at the time sort of grappling with my own identity as a composer, um, and as someone who's half Japanese, I'm always kind of grappling with my identity as a human. So those things kind of converged in this piece. Um, and it's a bit of a, a hodgepodge, a sort of exploration of my various musical influences from jazz and bluegrass and Americana to some Japanese folk music and Bartok and Brahms and all the, the composers that I love to perform. Um, 
So yeah, essentially it's, it's kind of an identity crisis in musical form, but I hope it comes across more as just So can I ask an, you a personal exploration. question? By, by the way, it's, it's great to meet you, Paul. This is actually, um, I've known about Paul for a while and this is our, our first actual meeting, which is virtual. It, it's kind of amazing. I, I don't know what your other half is. So you're half Japanese. What is your other half that you're in conflict with? Uh, mostly Polish. Oh, nice, me too. Uh, Oh, awesome. Yeah, but uh, my father was born uh, in Oklahoma. Um, so uh, the, the conflict isn't necessarily between the two halves. It's just finding uh, where I belong, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to travel to Japan. And I feel very uh, tied in with Japanese culture, having grown up speaking Japanese with my mother and you know, enjoying everything that the culture has to offer, mm -hmm. uh, food, especially, um, my whole life. And, um, and also I should say that the, the piece also, uh, reflects, um, a, a parallel sort of crisis, I suppose. Um, I wish Ayane were here to, to give, to back me up on this, but it also kind of reflects her journey as a person. She was born in Japan. Um, and I, I should say that I wrote this piece for her, um, and she moved from Japan to, uh, Dallas and then spent a couple of years in Dallas and then Chicago and then Cleveland and then Philadelphia and now New York. So she's also been on this journey and she had just moved to New York when I wrote her this piece. So we were both in this sort of searching, uh, kind of mindset. And you guys were partners at that point, correct? Yes. Fantastic. Um, and I guess people maybe on the Zoom call don't know that Paul is a fantastic cellist as well as composer. Um, I did see him play his own piece. So which it's great to actually see a composer play their own piece. I'm like, wow, that's really what he meant. It, it's amazing, you know, nowadays with YouTube and whatever videos you can drum up, you can, you can learn so much. I had a question as a composer um, and we play a, lo a lot of new music in the Minnesota Orchestra and some in our chamber group. And quite often we have the composers there. And some composers are, you know, extremely sensitive about their works that they've written and, and really, um, you know, don't want you to change a thing about them. And it's very, sometimes as a performer, it feels a little bit rigid, actually. I don't want to be negative about composers at all. But then some other composers, you know, just let it go. That's how you feel it, play it, you know. Um, and and that's always a great feeling with this piece. I really, um, because you wrote it so well, I didn't feel like, gosh, there's something here. I just have to like, you know, it, it might not be easy, but it makes sense. So it's, it's, it was relatively uh, fun to learn. And um, I don't know if once you, once you give birth to a piece, you feel like it's out there and then it's going to become whatever it becomes, or do you want to, like keep controlling that because what you meant is really what you meant, you know. <laughs> I mean, hearing you say that is actually music to my ears. That's the the ultimate uh, goal for me is to just let it go and you know let the performer have fun and take liberty. I'm still getting there. It's it's actually really tough to let go completely um, and then just trust. You know, my first few commissions. Um, I really, I got in there, I was maybe a little too much of a control freak and, you know, the, all the soundscapes and everything are very specific in my mind. And I'm, I'm learning over the years to let go of that. And at this point, um, I think American Haiku is a piece that just can, can live. I'm too happy to let it live and to let it evolve and there are actually a couple of different recordings that I've released with Ayane on YouTube, uh, a couple of very early recordings. And then uh, actually some, one of them was done just a, a few months ago from our living room during the early days of the lockdown uh, in New York. And you can see how much it's changed. Our own interpretation of the piece has evolved. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm learning that it's, I should I should let things go, but I really appreciate that you feel that I've already learned. I, I, I listened to two two different recordings of you and Ayane playing that the duo 
And I do agree, the second one was quite the most, the latest one in your living room uh, was quite different um, and quite evolved, I think. It was, a, it was actually a, a more compelling performance. So it was really nice to see that. And uh, Thank you. Uh, you know, we all try to do that as performers um, get through those things. I have a, a, one other question, or maybe more than one. Um, you composed, well, I, I read in your bio that you've done a little composing for a couple of films and you, you know, you're into jazz as well. I mean, do you have a favorite genre kind of for writing or is it, you know, just for the concert hall? Maybe, maybe it's more fun writing for films. I don't know, I'm, I'm just curious. It's, I, I guess I should bite my tongue a little bit here, but I will say I definitely prefer writing chamber music to be performed live. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love creating soundscapes and, and writing for, for a film, but it's essentially when you're scoring something, you have a boss, um, which is the, the picture, whatever you're, you're scoring. And you're always thinking about how to write music that's in service uh, to the scene, um, which it's a, it's a, is, it's, it's, it's its own uh, kind of uh, pleasure in creating music that really lines up perfectly with something and brings out hidden emotion in a scene. But when you're writing for the stage and for chamber musicians, there's a sense of just absolute freedom there in the process that's, um, it's addictive, it really is. That's great. I also think, you know, playing chamber music and listening to chamber music live of, of a really great performance is really one of the most, the most intense experiences you can have uh, artistically. You know, I think as a member of the Minnesota Orchestra, when we really get to a really high level in the orchestra, it's like that. It turns into this giant chamber music, which is also very compelling, but somehow sitting down and, and playing your duo and then playing a Haydn quartet um, for, for this concert, for instance, um, was really an intense, overly intense experience and, and not has nothing really to do with the lockdown, although you know, of course, we're all just wanting to play more and, and get out there and play for people, play for, for breathing, living bodies. Exactly. Uh, but but it's there's nothing like it. It kind of, um, it brings out, gets you in touch with your inner soul so, so directly uh, that uh, I'm, I'm so happy there are composers like you writing these days. News, and your stuff is incredibly original. And um, Thank you. also incredibly, um, what can I say? Uh, I think everybody can enjoy it, whether they know anything about music or not. You know what I mean? So that's one one major thing that used to concern me. My first couple of years that I started calling myself a composer was that after premieres and after seeing my piece being performed, uh, people would come up to me after the concert over and over and over and over again with the same basic con, con, uh, uh, comment, which was, you know, I've always hated new music or, you know, I've never understood new music or I've always been afraid of it, but your piece, I really enjoyed. And I was like, is this a, is this a good sign for a composer? Like, shouldn't we be a little more cutting edge than you know, making, making <laughs> that uh, you know, part of the audience music, happy. But that's what I like about your music. It speaks directly, you know, it, it has a, a way of speaking, direct, whether it's even just in, in a textural way, for instance, or a mood that you create, you know, it doesn't have to be a melody that I go home whistling. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mood and a context and your architecture of the duo, it's fantastic. I love, it's only, what is it, a nine, 10 minute piece. Um, but it has a wonderful architecture, so you feel like you've got something very complete when it's over, you know. And well, I've I've since come to embrace that, and I have you know I cherish those comments now, um, and uh, you know I'm not particularly thinking about what people want to hear uh, when I'm writing music. I'm thinking more about what I want to play and what I want to express, and I just hope that that connection. Uh, with the listener just burns brightly, no matter what's being said or what I'm expressing through the music. And so to get any sort of feedback like that is just 
um, it's priceless. That was a kind of a newbie, a newbie re first reaction. Uh, but so, so I have two more questions before you know. I know that we can't put all this on the call. It's a long conversation, which we could go on for a long time. First question um, is: Who was your biggest influence as a teacher? You're a little bit younger than I am, so you're a little closer to your education days. Of course, we all have teachers. I still have teachers. I'm 61, but um, who, who's whether it's cello or composition, who is has or what couple of people have influenced you the most? Uh, well, I never formally went to school for composition, um, so I've but I've gained mentors along the way just as, as a musician. And um, uh, Chick Corea would be a huge, a huge one, a huge mentor and uh, inspiration. I was lucky enough to tour with him and perform with him um, about 10 years ago when I was in the Harlem Quartet. And uh, we, we played with him and the vibraphone is Gary Burton and um, many, many evenings where he would just kind of point at us during the show and say, hey, take a solo here. And, you know, as uh, a classically raised cellist and kind of aspiring improviser, that kind of blew my mind. And I, I learned confidence and I learned, you know, how to improvise in public and uh, to be able to sit three feet away from him while he's, uh, you know, making miracles on stage at the Blue Note and um, the other amazing venues. It, it kind of changed my changed my view of music a little bit. Um, and I actually started uh, legitimately composing after leaving the Harlem Quartet. Um, and and that stage that those experiences with Chick were resonating so so loudly in my mind that he kind of he really. Uh, crept into my music as a huge influence. And um, I think there might actually be some moments in American Haiku where he, uh, you can hear him a little bit. And I I'm, would agree with that. And, and that's so nice to hear your memories and your inspiration. Of course, you know, the world is mourning the loss of Chick. Um, he was an incredible performer, uh, incredible inspiration to you, obviously, and I'm sure many other people. So. Um, well, anyway, we probably should wrap up our conversation so you can um, go ahead and start listening to our virtual concert again. And thank you so much for joining us, Paul. And thank you so much for writing your wonderful duo. Um, and please enjoy the concert today. Okay, they'll cut it off then. And then, uh, Paul, it's great to